So I, I mean, it just sounds ridiculous. I've been living in an abandoned town for six months by myself. But it's true, I'm here. I am sitting at Cerro Gordo Mining Town. This is a town that has been my residence for the past six months. I came up here in March to kind of escape the pandemic, figuring I'd come up for three, four weeks. Here we are, <laughs> six months later, I'm still here. And this is, this is home now. You know, I think before it was a place I would come and visit. Now it's home. When I'm not here, it's where I want to be. I'm not getting groceries, I want to come back. It's weird that somebody would be so excited about coming back to a, you know, old mining town, no running water. But I fucking love it here. All right, so why? Why am I in an abandoned ghost town miles from any other town with no running water? I ask myself that sometimes, but the answer is about just over two years ago, myself and a friend, John Beer, purchased a town called Cerro Gordo. And Cerro Gordo is a town about three hours from Los Angeles and three hours from Las Vegas. And it was at one point in time, the largest producer of silver for the state of California. There's 4,000 residents, 400 buildings, and it was a boom town. You know, these days there's about 20 buildings, one resident, and no running water. I knew it was a challenge getting into it. It's been a challenge, so it's hard to complain about what you signed up for. It's stimulating on all fronts. But I am here because in March of this year, our caretaker Robert wanted to be home with his wife for the pandemic. And so I was living in Austin, didn't need to be in Austin. So I packed up my truck, came out here, thinking I'd come for three or four weeks. A uh, bunch of snow hit. I got stuck. Ended up being here for a lot longer than I thought, but I'm still here. And now my priorities have changed, you know? The more time you spend at Cerro Gordo, the more it enchants you. It's weird to say out loud that I probably can do that, but like maybe see it in the video, it looks beautiful, but here, there's something about this place. It like casts a spell over you. And this is the only place you want to be. And I'm fully within that spell now. This is what I want to do with my life. I want to renovate this town. I want to bring it from a place that nobody can come really visit to a place where many of you can come, tour it, maybe even spend the night. So that's what I'm dedicated to. I'm dedicating my life to doing that. That's why I've been here for the past six months. That's why I'll be here for the next six months. I thought it'd be cool to kind of, you know, take an inventory of what's been going on in the last six months. How my personality's changed, how the projects have changed, what's gotten done, what hasn't gotten done, what I hope to get done. And maybe who knows, it'll be cool to look back at this video six months from now, I'm sure it'll change a lot. But without further ado, let's get into six months living in an abandoned ghost town by myself. All right, so we're at the bunkhouse and this is one of the early projects I did this year. And as you can see it's getting there. I mean, this floor used to have thick paint on it and there's terrible carpet all over the place that used to trap in the dust. Now, I mean, it's not there, but it's getting there. And you know, the floor looks a lot better. The kitchen, um, I haven't finished these yet, but you know, the bedrooms, they're nice. This took a while. I mean, there was carpet and I probably have a video that I could find of me ripping up the carpet and the carpet pad and then sanding that and then finishing it. 
But now it's at least comfortable. You know, we're not renting these out anytime soon. So people could come, stay in there, be comfortable at the very least. This used to just be like a room with a couch. But I got a mattress in there in case some people come and help out. They can crash in here. Pretty cool, look at that. We found those on site. There used to be sheep here. I haven't seen any, but you know, back when you had water, had a whole bunch of animals, I bet. That's creepy. It was a lot of work. You know, this, this took me on and off probably two or three months to rip out the carpet, do the floors, move some things back in. You know, I'll show you on into project number two, which is the former chapel here that used to be a mechanics garage. So originally, this was a mechanics garage, and underneath those seats was a pit where they were driving the vehicles, service the vehicles, and over time, the pit got covered. Uh, the old owners added the stained glass, and then when we took over the place, it was pretty much just floor to ceiling junk. You know, it was just old wood, stuff that maybe you'd use once upon a time, and so a lot of this winter was just sorting through that and going, Hey, this wood stays, this wood goes, and getting the wood to a place where we could store it or otherwise cut it up for kindling for in the houses or something. I think I'm a little off on this whole tripod thing, but hey, give the guy a break. You know what? Side note, I shoot all this stuff myself. So I have a tripod and I have the camera. This channel is interesting because you get to see almost real time me developing some skills, hopefully some skills. Like I remember the very first video shows me like getting stuck in the snow. And I did get stuck. People were like, why'd you get stuck? Cause it's a 140 horsepower two wheel drive Tacoma that's super lightweight and spins out with street tires. And people are like, oh, I could get through that. Nowadays that wouldn't happen, right? And in the first video I ever made, I got caught way out in a snowstorm. I didn't really know where I was. That wouldn't happen now. I'd have done probably a hundred hikes since then, further than that. And so I think it's cool for me too, to look back at those videos and I would make some of the same comments. I was like, man, what's this guy getting into? But I'm developing skills as I, as I go. One of which is the camera to kind of bring that back to whatever I was talking about. You know, I think as far as skills, I've been learning a lot about like outdoor stuff, you know, hiking, different things like that. Uh, renovation, basic construction things. I've had people come up and help me and teach me the ropes there. Mine exploration, animal tracking, hopefully some photography, I've gotten really good at bow and arrow. I have a compound bow up here, 50 pound for you guys interested, a Hoyt, if you guys are really interested, that I love. And so I've been shooting that a lot, getting pretty good at that. Um, yeah, just, you know, I really, I just feel a lot more confident with all my skills. I think up here, you learn to depend on yourself. You forget something, too bad, figure it out. Don't have the right screw, figure it out some other way. And so it's been a six months of a lot of personal growth as well as, you know, growth for the town. We're over on the back side of the property now. If you remember my first video when I was building that deck on the small cabin, the writer's retreat, this is it. So this is where I kind of come and relax sometimes if <laughs> Cerro Gordo gets too busy, which is hilarious to talk that, you know, a ghost town 30 miles from anything would be too busy. But, you know, we've recently had a lot of people come and help with the hotel and volunteers and coordinators and stuff and you know, I think it's weird, but the more time I spend up here, the less bandwidth I have for social interaction. And I know that sounds really strange, but hey, maybe there's a reason I bought a town in the middle of nowhere. You know, I, I love interacting with people, but to an extent, and it's weird that window, let's say it used to be like four hours. It's now maybe like an hour and I kind of get burnt out and I just want to retreat away. So this is my retreat away. No power here. No water, of course, no nothing. Phone doesn't really work. So this is a place where I can come and sit. And from my perspective, I just look out over Death Valley and just relax, you know? Day's pretty much done now. So I just come over here, decompress, unwind a little bit. I'll show you guys in the cabin. It's pretty basic, but I always want to keep the cabins over here a little bit more basic. And this is my, uh, this is my getaway within the getaway, so to speak. So we're inside a little artist retreat now. And I think when I look back over the past six months, it hasn't all been easy, you know? It's been tough, it's been difficult. There were some of the most trying weeks of my life around the fire. 
You know, it's a, a week where the crown jewel of the town burned down. I saw my hopes and dreams burn down in front of me. Not even a couple days after that, we had an earthquake that shook around the place a little bit. And then a hailstorm that not only knocked out the road, but knocked out the power. And I remember at one point when it was power was out, it rained again. I just laughed. You know, it was one of those things where, you know that scene in Truman Show where he's trying to get to the edge of the dome and they keep making the weather more and more intense and things more difficult to stop him from getting to the side. And eventually he just looks up and he laughs, this manic laugh. And I remember just having a really similar laugh during that period because, I mean, what else are you going to do? Fire, earthquake, hailstorm. It was intense, but hey, here we are. I made it through. I think that's a big thing that's happened the last six months too. I'm pretty confident of most situations you throw me into that I know I'm going to come out the other side, hopefully a little bit stronger. I do think mentally I'm stronger after these six months. I think my priorities are a lot more in order. Back in the city, it's really easy to distract yourself with small tasks to take up your day and take your eye away from bigger goals. Like I remember in Austin, let's say a difficult thing that I was supposed to be doing, suddenly I would have to go to the grocery store and have to go to get that one specific item that I needed for that night. And it was really just a way to not address things or sit with ideas that maybe I didn't want to sit with. You know, it's a way of filling your days. And I think a lot of us are guilty of that, right? Probably a lot of you. I know I do it. Is you fill your days with seemingly needed tasks so you don't have to address the things that you know you really want to do. And up here, that all falls away. I'm not streaming anything, you know? Netflix isn't available. So I'm here, I'm in it, and it's awesome. Project number next is the Gordon House. House built for L.D. Gordon in 1910. Had some cats out there, that's why there's some bulls. But this was a project. There was, so when we bought it, there was actually carpet down on this. So we ripped up the carpet, there was linoleum. And then underneath the linoleum, there's more linoleum. And then finally, there was this hardwood floor, which is looking beautiful these days. This is where I have to come over every day to cook my breakfast as the only working stove in Cerro Gordo at the moment. Um, this kitchen's pretty cool. Ah, I forgot my revolver and my harness that I go down in the mines with. But this is a cool place. It's one of my favorite buildings. It was a lot of work. Um, it's kind of where we have people stay when they come now. Because it's the largest. It's got this great view typically. And then down here, we got bedroom, bedroom. My little cabin poking through the window. Hello. Uh, might have some ghosts over here or something. Hello. Anyways, this is my favorite bathroom at Cerro Gordo. If you go down here, not only does it have the clawfoot tub, the cool toilet, and all the creepy finishings, but if you are to look out this window, if they hear me, they're gonna go nuts. That is where the goats are. Ready for this? Watch this. Goats! <laughs> there she is. Topo, you see me? Uh-oh, she spotted me. Now she's demanding, oh, and ghosts. Now she's demanding food. I'll go feed them, but I mean, it's pretty awesome to shower, look at goats. That's my shower, it's in a bag. You fill it up with water. I hang it up here. So you're like, hey, how do you shower in a ghost town? Right there. You know it's not the best, but it's not the worst. And again, check out that view, right? Tofu! <laughs> it's like clockwork, it's so good. I gotta go feed them. So now we gotta deal with these demanding goats. So I'm break them off a flake. Come with me. Yeah, I'm coming. I mean, you see me. 
Hello, hello. I feed them three or four times a day just so they don't eat too much at one sitting. There you go. Enjoy. Ah, happy goats. You know what they say, happy goats, happy life. <laughs> Something like that. And so yeah, that's them. That's the bathroom we were just looking out up there. And in relation to the rest of the town, it's that. It's so smoky because of these fires, it's terrible. That's one of my favorite scenes right there, look at that. The assay building and the old tram with the tailing pile. <laughs> so, other projects. Do cats count as projects? Because I think that they should. I have seven kittens that are a recent addition, but definitely a project in their own right. This one I'm calling Gordo. And Gordo likes to climb up, hello. Likes to climb up my leg when I'm trying to do work. Or my shirt. But I heard that's normal. Oh, you're purring. Nope, out. Nope, too close. Excuse me, that's my leg. Excuse me. Pay attention. My leg is not a climbing apparatus. And much like the goats, the second these cats see me, they're here. Yeah, I know. Yo, what do you want? They're here. And so, they're great. Eventually I hope that they're kind of a, uh, hello. They'll kind of help reduce the mice population up here. Tons of mice, so that'd be nice, but. What's you doing down there? I'm editing video of you here, and I see you here. Seven kittens, four goats, and this talkative little one. I remember when I first got the goats, the farmer I got them from was like, oh, are you gonna eat them? These are boar goats. They'll get to be like 300 pounds, and they usually used for meat. And I was like, no, just pets. I remember he kind of looked at me and did one of those, because he wasn't used to that. But just being up here for so long, by yourself, any type of life is just, you know, companionship in some way. So I never thought I'd be the guy with goat and kitten friends, but now I got the goats and the kittens, and it does help, you know, those days when you're just fully by yourself, even being around any type of heartbeat, I guess, makes you feel a little less lonely, but, you know, Tofu's a pretty good friend. I can talk to her all day. Hears me out every time. Right, like Tofu? You think that's a good idea? I think it's a good idea. This is a relatively new addition. This is uh, the Polaris, how I get around. It was kind of long-term given to me so I can get around the property a little bit easier. And this is, I gotta say, probably my favorite thing, my favorite addition to the property in the past years. It just unlocks so much more of the property that prior wasn't able to get to. Or for today, for example, there's this mine that I kind of saw out of the corner of my eye and to walk there would have been two hours. But with this thing, I got there in 10 minutes from the town. The mine was collapsed, I couldn't get into it. So imagine walking two hours to find that out. In this case, it was a 10 minute drive, got back and hey, still had a fun ride over there. So this Polaris has been a, man, it's been a blessing. I love it. I've got, taken this thing everywhere. That's how I can explore so many more mines. Uh, it's so much easier than taking the truck places. It's safer probably too. And yeah, I just, I love this thing. Other than that, probably my second favorite toy that I've gotten or uh, gifted to me was a drone. Uh, you might have seen some of the videos that had some drone shots. You maybe see that I don't have the drone anymore and that is because I crashed the drone. I was trying to do this thing where these drones these days, they can like follow you. And so I thought, ooh, you know what would be cool is like to follow the Razor while I'm going out to a mine. So I decided to follow it in this follow me mode. So it was looking cool, looking cool. And then there's something called boomerang mode where basically it swings around and it sees you. And I had been told that these drones are so smart these days, they avoid things, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not just content with it following me. I wanted to boomerang all of a sudden. And I wanted to boomerang when I'm going down a hill in a wooded area. So it boomeranged all right, but it boomeranged right into a tree. Now I don't have a drone. Luckily they have this replacement thing where they replace it for you for free, but I'm still without a drone for a while. And it's kind of one of those things that you don't know what you're missing until you have it or don't have it. You get whatever that thing is. Uh, and I'm missing the drone. Fingers crossed it'll be back soon. So as far as exciting additions to the town, Polaris and drone. 
I recommend them to any of you who may have a ghost town in the near or distant future. And if you already get a ghost town, if we're on the subject, I have two things that I would tip you off if you want a ghost town of your own. Number one, make sure it has some history. History is what makes Cerro Gordo interesting and that's a necessity in a ghost town. Number two, running water. Just a tip, but everything's a lot easier with water. So I want this video to be about my time up here, but I figured I'd give a quick background on myself just because people ask sometimes. I was born in Boston. I grew up south side of Tampa, Florida for my whole life. My parents are both school teachers, public school teachers. So I'm not rich. I know people see headlines and think, oh, you must be rich. No, I've worked a lot during my life, all through high school and on. Uh, I went to school at Florida State for undergrad on a scholarship. I ended up going to Columbia in New York City for grad school. I'm still paying for that. Probably the worst decision of my life, but that's a whole other story. Uh, I moved to Austin, Texas about six years ago and I ran a backpacker hostel there. So, you know, bunk beds and rooms where people could come and share experiences and times. And that was kind of like my first entry point into the combination of history and hospitality. So the building there was built in 1893. So it was really old. And I thought it was so cool that people would come to Austin, not just stay in a Marriott with all four of the walls looking the same as every other Marriott around the world, but stay in a piece of that town's history. And so I did that, it was going well. And then about two and a half years ago, a friend of mine named Aaron texted me a link to this ghost town for sale. And man, was I intrigued. Right off the bat, I was like, Wow, he, he texted to me at like three o'clock in the morning and he said, LOL, check out this. This might be your next project. Almost as a joke. So I woke up and I read everything about the town and I'm obsessed. You know, I was just like, this is it. This is the one. So I remember I, I emailed or I called the real estate broker, Jake, who's now a friend. And I was like, hey, Jake, I'd love to put an offer for the town. And he kind of laughed. He's like, hey, get in line because the town is really popular. There's a lot of bids. Long story short, we ended up buying it. We closed. July 13th, 2018, which was Friday the 13th. John Beer on Business Partner's birthday as well. All great coincidences. And this is what I want to do. When I'm not here, this is what I want to get back. I want to get to work. And I think it's important. And I think finding something that you think is important that you want to dedicate your life to is rare. And I'm just really fortunate that I found Cerro Gordo and that I'm able to work on it. This is the general store, now becoming the museum. This is project number, I'm not sure. I'm probably gonna change the order in editing and get really mad at myself for naming any of them. So we're just gonna say this is the next project. But before, this was just storage. So this floor, you couldn't really even see. So that's a haul that I brought out of the mine the other day as a side note. I didn't even sort through it, but there's some cool gloves and shirts and denim in there. But this has been curated, just cleaned up a bit, make it a little bit nicer for people to come visit. Check out some of the old stuff from the town. Even got some of our t-shirts up there these days. Put a link in the bio just in case you want one. Um, and then back here is kind of everything I find when I explore mines. So what, two videos ago I found that jacket. Boom, there it is. This is other stuff. And so this before was just floor to ceiling junk as well. So it took forever to clean this out, dust these off, Kind of curate what to put into them. But I'm really happy with how it turned out. I think this building is the center of building in town. And it's, you know, it's probably one of the coolest that we got up here. All right, let's talk water. Water has been the missing puzzle piece at Cerro Gordo for the past 100 years. You know, back in the day, Cerro Gordo was supplied by springs around the property that were fed and upkept by Owens Lake below us. And then Owens Lake got drained as part of the LA Aqueduct Program, where LA purchased water rights from inner California and redirected the water back into the city to supply the city with fresh water. And so Cerro Gordo kind of got left high and dry without water. So for the past hundred years, the different owners have been trying different things to get water. You know, trucking up is a big thing. Um, and then the most precarious or recent, somewhat reliable water source was 700 feet under right where I'm sitting. I am sitting in an original hoist cage from the late 1800s. And this cart 
goes 900 feet straight down below me. And every 100 feet, there's branches of mines. So imagine it goes down, branches off, mines, another 100 feet, mines, almost like levels, except for there's no buttons to get where you're stopped and you're being supported by this 150 year old cable. But down at the 700 level, water started pooling or seeping in from the mountain. So down there, there's this reservoir of water, or so we were told, it's almost like mythical. Because when we bought the property, we were told the water was impossible to get, that it was too dangerous, uh, wasn't sure that it was even there anymore, and not worthwhile to go get. And you know, I, I bought into that for a year and a half. I was like, you know what? Too dangerous, not getting the water. Plus, who wants to go down and trust their life on this 150 year old piece of machinery? But recently, you know, a couple people with a lot of history at Cerro Gordo that have been coming up here for 30 or 40 years told me, listen, if you want to make a run of that water, we'll get a team together. And uh, hey, that's all I had to hear. That's all I had to hear. I, I've been up here for a while, I'm getting more confident with stuff. So put together a crew, put together a very experienced operator that can operate the hoist. So basically control the cable that lets this cage down. Found the man who had last seen the pump running that actually had a replacement pump and just some other people. So supposedly what happened was back in the day, they would, the water would pool at the 700 level and there's a pump down there and the pump would pump the water 700 feet straight up and come out this pipe right over there. And that's how the town had water for at least 10 or 20 years. That's how water was supplied to the town. And then the pump burnt out about 15 years ago or so rumor has it. And so for the past 15 years, Cerro Gordo has been without any running water at all. And let me tell you, you don't truly appreciate how much your life depends on running water until you don't have it. I mean, I know you're probably theorizing, oh, showers are tough, this stuff, everything is more difficult. I've gotten used to it over the past six months, but every time that I go back to like a hotel to take a shower or something, it's just like, wow, you know, I can turn on the sink and I can wash my hands instead of having to pour some water into a bowl, you know, and wash your hands that way. So anyways, back in the day, the pump burned out, so the theory went, but it was told it was too dangerous to get and there might not be water. So about two or three weeks ago, we got this team together and we got in this cage. We put some test weight. We ran up and down to make sure to support people. And then we got after it, you know, went down 700 feet straight down. Right now we're finally reached the 700 foot level after several repairs going down. Got your hat, got your glasses, got your, got my got your light. Listen guys. You got your life in Cody's hands. Mo thing. Yes. Be very aware that that's open on Yes. Besides, we kind of had to watch each other yesterday. Yeah, yeah. put your hands on that so side. So just yeah. be aware. Yeah, we got to hold on to these things right here. Yep, I got it. That one, one this one, that yeah, one, whatever. Yeah. Right I put a, my arm through a rope. Yeah, cool. Oh, there you go. Okay. Tell me, tell him, uh, take us down. You all right? Woo. You're going down to the center. Woohoo! You guys have to the center up there. Cool. Tell my wife I love her. <laughs> yeah. Cool. There's water leaking right here, just as a note. Traffic. Water's leaking. That looks like a check, maybe. What do you think, in Kenya? Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, and no more leaks. You know, we need to look for leaks yeah. down here. Right below. Because if it doesn't leak from here down, which I don't think it is, right. well, we wouldn't have this kind of water. So that would be our, our junction right there. That would be just so cool. Yeah, I'll take a nice yeah. it's raining on us in here. Yeah. Fear, the ultimate challenge. Oh, that is quite. <laughs> that looks pretty precarious. Yeah, it's okay. I'm gonna see if there's any of that timber for the guys, I guess. Okay, yeah, be damn careful. Yeah. That's just caved in. 
<laughs> this that stuff there must lead this this pipe must lead to that. Yeah. I wouldn't be too worried about heavy metal in here because I don't think you're gonna be drinking this water anyhow. Right, no, I just for flushing toilets and stuff. Toilets and shower. Yeah. Oh, lucky no, strike. That's a fine. Yo, lucky yeah. strike. Yeah, those are so cool. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's that's these these are new. Right. This is old. Yes. Right there. Huh? I know, and I know how particular you are. We're uh, we're gonna load up here. Give us about a minute or so. We're gonna load up and uh, let's head up to the 500 and stop there. Look around. This is the first time that that hoist has been a 700 level in 15 years. We are replacing the pump next. Then we're gonna pressurize the system, follow it back up for leaks, survey how much pipe we have to replace, shut it down, come back, replace the pipe, and Sarah Gordo is gonna have water for the first time in 15 years. I went down there, saw the water with my own eyes, Oh, so that's it. Right. Right. That's the pool. The sump. Yeah. The water. <laughs> okay. And you know, it was like a series of exciting events. You know, you didn't know the water was going to be, you didn't know that the hoist was going to work. Hoist works. That's exciting. Don't know if water's going to be down at 700 feet. Go down 700 feet. Water's there. That's exciting. You don't know if you can replace the pump. Pump gets replaced and it's working. That's exciting. Then 500 feet of piping was burst. So we had to replace 500 feet of pipe. And then that gets replaced and water starts trickling out up here. <laughs> 245. Woo. That's water. afternoon. Water is coming to Sarah Gordon. <laughs> First time since, uh, well, hell, it's been 14 years. Woof. Almost 15. Look at that water. Oh, hell yeah. And it's just the first time I'd seen running water at Cerro Gordo ever for me. That was a big moment. But then you have to get the water from here down to the main town. And to do that, you rely on these underground pipes that have been down there for who knows how long, decades, 50, 60 years. And so that happened. <laughs> the cart just moved a little bit and my stomach kind of dropped. If this thing falls, I fall straight down. So I just completely <laughs> lost my train of thought. Um, ugh. Anyways, so the water gets from here, it goes down to the town. And then when the water got down to town, that was an exciting day. So probably the most exciting day that I've had at Saragora so far was the day I saw water trickling down by the bell shot in the Gordon house. That's something that we had heard might happen, but to actually see it happen and to get the job done, we relied on a lot of local support. We had some amazing guys out of Independence, Bishop, Lone Pine, that really kind of made this thing happen. And it's not an overstatement to say that's historic because it is. You know, water is the missing piece here and we somewhat got it back. It's not perfect. In fact, it stopped going down there and the pump turned off after about a week. So we're going back down in this cage in three days to see why it stopped. But as far as projects go, this was a big one. You know, getting water back here, getting this thing working again. And for me, going down there and seeing a level of the mine that hadn't been explored in a really long time was super cool. But water's amazing. I'm gonna get off this thing because it's moving around a little bit. I don't know if it's the wind, but this thing drops. I mean, you won't see this video of this thing drop. So if you're seeing this video, know that it didn't drop, but I am getting up. All right, I guess a six months update wouldn't be an update without an American hotel update. Uh, the American hotel burnt down June 15th of this year. It was kind of the crown jewel of Cerro Gordo. It was a center building. 
It was built in 1871 and burned down and it's tragic, you know. It's still hard for me to talk about. I try not to talk about it. That's probably why I'm dealing with it last, but it burned down. Numerous fire investigators have come up. They found the wiring. It was a hundred years of people tinkering with wiring that probably shouldn't be tinkering with wiring. It's nothing that we did. We hadn't done any electrical work in that building, but it burned down. And the first two weeks were really tough. Um, I just didn't really see what we were gonna do. But since we've had a huge rallying of support, both locally and abroad, uh, the support from this channel has been so awesome. You guys don't know how much it means. Even just a comment or subscribing to the channel just means a lot. And we've begun the process of rebuilding it, you know? We've had volunteers up here, a lot of people finding out about it from the YouTube channel, coming up and helping clear the site. We've been actively working with an architect to get the proper plans in place to get our permit. We have an engineer doing the plans. So on the 23rd of this month, hopefully we'll get the final thumbs up to rebuild. And the plan is, yeah, we're gonna rebuild as close to how it used to look as we could uh, using original wood. The inside will have fire sprinklers, fire suppression, um, things of that nature. And it's been difficult, but really motivating in the same way. I think a lot of people from the local community were sitting on the sidelines. Now that they see how serious we are about it, people have been coming forward with their time, you know, their donations, their equipment that we can use, their expertise that we can use. And we've had an outpouring of support, all rallying behind getting this building built again. You know, these people from all different types of backgrounds. And it's been really inspiring and motivating for me to get up and work all day on this project when all these other people are helping as well. And it's just been amazing. And so plans will hopefully be approved in a few weeks. We'll do as much work as we can until the winter. Winter's gonna hit in about a month and we won't be able to do too much. Hit the ground running really hard in the spring. Get all the final ducks in the row as far as any paperwork and engineering. And yeah open this thing up next summer. I know it's an aggressive timeline, but that's what we're trying to do. And I think we have the, I think we can pull it off. And so stay tuned for the American Hotel updates. So that's six months here at Cerro Gordo. Thank you so much for watching this video. This has been six of the best months of my life. I feel like I found, you know, a, a calling, a purpose here in this property, something that I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about sharing it. I'm really grateful that you guys watch, that you guys are supporting the town in the way this happened. If you haven't already, as I always say, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment of other videos you wanna see. Uh, stay tuned, last night, I actually spent the night hundreds of feet down in the main Union Mine. I had to get there with the cage, lowered down, dropped off, dropped off at six or 7 p.m., picked up at 8 a.m., so I'm a little bit tired still from that, but I'm excited as always, so. Stay tuned, a lot more cool things to come on this channel, hopefully a lot more of these six month updates. But uh, until then, signing off, thank you. Have a good day.